This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. comes from four years of unexpected and unprecedented crisis. First, the COVID-19 pandemic that wreaked havoc on the economy, then Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent energy crisis. Rules limiting government spending were lifted, debts and deficit ballooned, as governments opened the spending tap to throw a lifeline to struggling businesses and households. Four years later, we are in a very different environment. While debt to GDP ratios vary greatly in the EU, they remain historically high, at above 100% in six EU countries. While inflation relieves some of the debt burden, interest rates are rising, making it more expensive to service high debts. In this context, the Commission has proposed to reform the rules governing public expenditure in the EU, seeking to center the new approach on debt sustainability. We will be discussing this and many more questions with our panelists, but first let me give you some housekeeping remarks. This political event happens with today within a broader event titled A Very European Puzzle, Balancing Budgets and Promoting Growth by, by Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos. We would like to make it as interactive as possible, so please join us by tweeting on it uh, at, at Live Politico and ask questions through Slido, so that's sly.do, using the hashtag Politico Spotlight. I will be prioritizing questions with a name and an organization to it to make it more transparent for our viewers and our panelists. You can already share your thoughts and answer the following poll presented by our partner, should the EU change its fiscal policy paradigm? And we, look, we will look at the results at the end of this event. So let's kickstart things by welcoming uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Vincent van Pettingen uh, to the stage. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. So Belgium is an interesting one when it comes to the question of fiscal rules because you are one of the countries that has seen debt to GDP ratio increase quite substantially, currently at around 106%. You forecast an increase in your annual deficit from 3.9% in 2022 to 5% this year. The Commission last week has given you some recommendations in the context of the European semester asking Belgium to keep the increase in net primary expenditure below 2%. So my question to you is how quickly are you going to be balancing the books and how quickly will you be able to meet the 3% deficit annual target? Well, in the stability uh, program that we proposed to the Commission, we actually looking forward to go below the 3% by uh, 2026, so in three years, as, as well as is indicated in uh, the, the communication of the, of the Commission. Um, but of course, this is a broader, um, broader story. If you look to indeed our deficit and to our debt level, we indeed see that uh, this, is, this is too high uh, today, definitely our deficit. And the, the drivers for that are, of course, uh, different, but there are actually two main drivers. The one driver is, of course, the increase of the interest rates with the high debt that we uh, currently have. But second, of course, also the fact that we have an aging population, which uh, puts, uh, puts a, a, a big burden on our pensions and also on our healthcare uh, sector. So if you want to do something on that deficit in, in a structural way, there we definitely need to do some structural, uh, structural reforms. One of the things also that the Commission has asked you and you have already started doing is to peeling back the measures linked to the pandemic and to the energy crisis. And the budgetary impact of these measures will be declining from 0.9% last year to 0.4% this mm -hmm. year. Yet you also propose a reform of VAT rates and there is wage indexation in Belgium for the public sector, which are both contributing to widening the deficit. 
As a result, you will likely incur in what that you call an excessive deficit procedure. Are you scared, number one? <laughs> and how quickly are you going to um, peel these measures back? Well, of course, if you look to the, the, the measures that we have today, like, for example, the automatic indexation, that actually helped us as well during the, du during the crisis. If you, if you look to the, both the energy crisis and the corona crisis, we actually have seen that due to that uh, automatic indexation, we actually have the, the we, we, we were able to uh, keep our, the purchasing power of our, of our people during these, uh, these crises, which actually also helped them if you compare that to many other um, uh, European countries, neighboring countries, but also other European countries, you actually see that their purchasing power uh, went, went down, while our was actually quite, quite stable over that, uh, that whole period. And this is, of course, an advantage that we see, of course, with all the measures that we also took uh, in, in, uh, in addition. It actually also, of course, had an impact on our budget. Now, if we then look to what will happen if next year uh, we, we, the, the general escape clause will, uh, will be ended, that, that means that we will go back to the old rules if no new rules uh, will be installed. And then, of course, we, we can uh, get in that, in that excess, excessive deficit uh, procedure, which, of course, yeah, am I scared? Yeah, I, I want to avoid that, that's, that's for sure. And that's also the reason why we put also in our program and in, in, the, in the medium term, we want to go back to that 3% um, deficit level. Thank you. Let's come then to uh, the rules, new rules, old rules. Uh, the Commission has presented plans for overhauling the so-called Reform and Stability Pact with the goal of giving countries some more time and some more ownership of their debt reduction mm -hmm. speed. Um, from a Belgian perspective, can you tell us what is good and what is bad in what the Commission has proposed? Well, for the moment, we don't have really a, a Belgian position, but you probably come back on that later. But, but in my personal opinion, and I, and I really believe that what is currently on the table is, a, is, is the, the start of a, of, a, of a landing zone where we can, uh, with all the different positions that you also see in Europe, where we can come. In, in my personal opinion, I really uh, see two uh, main advantages. The, the, the first one is definitely the fact that you look a little bit in a, in a longer uh, time frame and you also have the p possibility to extend that, that time period from four to, to seven years. That multi-annual approach is actually um, yeah, very positive because you, you, you cannot always look to your budget and especially not if you, for example, like in Belgium, you need to do some structural reforms. Uh, you cannot only look to the, to the short term, to the one year and year to year ev um, evolution of that, of that deficit and your debt rate. So it's, it's very good that you have a, a medium uh, term, long term perspective in, that, in these budget, in, the, in these rules. Uh, second, I also think that the di diversification that you have among the different member states are also taken into account. And that exactly gives the the, 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 the responsibility and, and the fact that there is more ownership on what you actually do. Um, and that is also um, linked to the fact that while in the past and the old rules are mainly focused on what, uh, what I call only the, the, the debt reduction and the debt evolution um, that, that you will have as, as a country, now they're also taking into account, and that's of course also linked with that multi-annual approach, they also look at, at the fact that you, what I call the always a holy trinity, not only the debt evolution and the debt level reduction that you will have, but also to are you going to invest, what are the investments that you are going to do, and what are the reforms, the structural reforms that actually have a very huge impact on that uh, debt and deficit level, um, how are you going to implement uh, these, uh, these things, and that holy trinity can actually give also a more uh, broader approach to the uh, idea about where the, the, the budget and, and the debt level are going in the, in the near, uh, in, you know, in the short and uh, medium term. So far, you're seeing the praise of the proposals. Is there anything in there which you know requires further attention, further negotiation, from your point of view? Well, uh, what, what I today, of course, see is that um, we we have, for example, the position of, of, of Germany that focused a lot on on a common numerical approach, uh, on on numerical uh, benchmarks. I think it's it's a good thing that the the Commission actually included. The, there's already in the proposal, although it's not uh, usual that they do it like this, but it's good that it is already uh, included. But I don't think that we need to 
move further and that, that you actually are going to strengthen further these, these numerical or that numerical approach and these benchmarks. I think that it will be important that, uh, especially also for high debt countries and, and countries that were not able to meet the Maastricht rules, that there as well you have the possibility to have some diversification, differentiation among the member states because every country has its own uh, context. Every country has its own background. Uh, a country like Belgium with very high um, or an, an aging population has a completely different context than, than other countries. Maybe also with a high debt level, but maybe with much more one-off uh, deficit um, expenditures and, and challenges than a country like Belgium, where the problems are more structural due to that uh, aging, uh, aging context or aging population. Thank you. Um, it will maybe fall on you to actually clinch a final deal because let's remind our audience, Belgium will take over the helm of the council in the first half of 2024 and the schedule for negotiation, you never know, but it seems like um, the trilogues and the discussions with the parliament will happen under your presidency. How will you manage that and will you manage that? Well, you of course never know what will happen in the next uh, weeks, months, uh, year. Uh, I do believe, and then I'm really convinced about that, is that you need to finish these negotiation discussions by the end of this term, so maybe before the European elections. I think it's important that you give um, predictability, uh, also uh, stability to, 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 the, to the Eurozone and to, to, uh, to Europe in, as a whole. Um, it's important also as well for the predictability in the financial markets and so on. So I, I really believe and I'm convinced that it's necessary that in the, in the next months we actually finalize this discussion. Um, that will also be the, the, the main question for me. Uh, and, and that's also the, 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 the position that the member states will need to decide where they are. Do they want to come and agree on, on a new uh, framework, on, a new, um, on new rules? Um, or and, yeah, and, and actually update the, the rules that, that, uh, that we have, or will they and go back to the old rules where we know that these rules are not working today, that they are unrealistic, that some things like, for example, the 120 rule is completely unrealistic, uh, or do we want to, and that's, that's the, the, the first option I gave, do we want to go to an, another framework in which we have ex ante much more flexibility, but ex post also more possibilities to actually yeah, um, um, state that it, it's necessary and that, that, you, that you will actually also um, force member states to actually uh, execute these, uh, the, the things they, um, they agreed upon uh, with, uh, with the Commission. Since you are in that room when the Council discusses these things, I wish I was, but I can't. <laughs> can you tell us... You can bit? always participate to the elections. Uh. <laughs> we do. <laughs> but anyways, uh, we cover it very extensively. <laughs> um, can you give us a sense of the first discussion that you had in Council level on the European reform? Because what I hear and what we've reported is that we're far from the world maybe of the last time that we reformed the fiscal rules where there was a very clear north-south or a hawks and doves division. But there is, as you mentioned, one player which is instrumental and without whom new rules cannot really be agreed, Germany, who has taken a much more um, strict position or let's say they want safeguards and reassurance and they say that what the Commission has proposed, even including the, um, the last minute changes that were made to the proposals are not enough for them. Are they isolated in the council? Are they, is it 26 against one or is there more of a... Debate? Yeah, I, d I don't think that today in, in the discussion that we have, we don't have to look like the 26 to one or, or keeping one outside of the discussion because of the fact that it, that for, for example, the preventive arts, you also have the uh, qualitative majority that is that is enough. So I don't think that we have to look at that. I think that if we make new rules, if we make a new framework, everybody needs to be on board. That's really important. And therefore we need to listen to everyone, to the concerns of everyone. Belgium as well have still some, some technical issues, some technical questions, like many other countries. What I hear around the table is that, and it depends of course um, on, on, the, on the, the, the situation, the context of each individual country and member state, but what I feel around the table is that th many member states actually appreciate the proposal um, that, that is put on the table by the, by the Commission. And I also hear very constructive remarks on, the, on that proposal. So I, don't, I think that we now will need to look how can we bring everybody around the table and, and move forward, all 27. I think that is really, really important. 
will be a tough job, and so good luck with that. Um, can you tell us a bit what are the other priorities in your file uh, during the Belgian presidency? Well, we have um, the, well, let's say, disadvantage that we have the European elections in, during our presidency. That means that we will have to do everything that is still on the table. We will try to finish. Um, I think that there are still some files in the next, uh, let's say, two, yeah, eight to, 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 to ten months uh, that it will be important. I think it will be about, of course, the uh, economic governance review. It will be about uh, the banking union. Uh, and especially the crisis management uh, framework that is put on the table where we need to uh, make uh, steps forward. We also need to look, and that it will definitely also be on the table with respect to the capital market union where we also still have some challenges uh, in front of us and where I think that it's necessary that we, um, that we move forward. And then of course, and that's more from the, the, the Belgian perspective, um, where we also put some, some files on the table, like for example, the VAT gap, which is uh, for a country like Belgium, but actually for many other countries as well, and a real, uh, real challenge. Everything that has to do with customs, um, there as well we see a huge, um, well, huge uh, challenges as well, um, especially if you look to the port of Antwerp, uh, the port of, uh, and then in the other ports, but also the port of Rotterdam, which has a problem with, with uh, the, the drugs. And it will be important that we uh, work together, share more information. And that's also now a proposal on the table where I really want to move forward. And then an, 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 a problem or a challenge, let's say, like this, is how are we going to deal with, with taxes of uh, the teleworkers, mm -hmm. people that work, for example, in Bel uh, that um, live in Belgium, but that work abroad in, in the Netherlands in Luxembourg or in France, but the other countries as well have this problem. Uh, there, of course, you see that due to the COVID and due to the increased uh, importance of, of telework that you have new challenges and we, we, we need to start that discussion as well uh, at the European level, but maybe also at the, at the OECD level. And these are some very specific topics that I also would like to put on the, on the table. Thank you. I'm going to dive a little bit into Belgian politics, if you allow me. Um, but it's linked to this because we have talked about Belgian's debt and deficit. And on the revenue side, you're actually authoring a overhaul of the tax system in Belgium, which aims to be more progressive. So to lower the burden of taxation on labor um, and increase taxation on wealth, wealth and consumption. Can you tell us a bit what's the goal of this reform and what's the likelihood of getting the Vivaldi coalition to agree to it? <laughs> The first question is easier than the second, but um, let me first so say something about the tax reform. Um, we actually, uh, we know it of course, but every year when we see the OECD um, uh, studies that are made, we see that we are actually the world champion if it's about uh, the, the burden on, on taxes and the tax, uh, the burden on, uh, on labor and the taxes on labor. So you, you actually see there that we are the, the world champion. While on the other hand, for example, for consumption, but also for, for wealth, um, the, the taxes there are, are lower. Uh, for example, for consumption, we're at the, at the bottom of the, of the ranking, which means that the, 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 our whole tax system is actually a little bit un unbalanced. At the same time, we also, of course, hear and, and we see it as well on, on the labor market that we are really looking for people. But if you look to the, to the, 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 the Belgium situation, we, we notice that the difference between working and not working in terms of, of revenue is, is, is actually too limited. So we actually want to, by uh, lowering the, the taxes on, uh, on labor, we actually wanted to, to make uh, work more interesting, uh, working more also make more interesting. Uh, and that is definitely one of the, the, the main reasons and the, the, the main uh, goals of and objectives of, uh, of this tax reform. But of course, we also need to look at and, and how can we, for example, um, reform the, the, the system itself. Yeah, for example, uh, you, you see that uh, uh, married couples and you also see it in the OECD studies have a, has, have a more positive or, or pay less taxes than, for example, someone who is uh, single. Uh, I think that we have to be more neutral in the way how people uh, live together. That's also part of the, the, the reform that is on the table. But as well, uh, on, on, on balancing more the taxes on, on wealth, on, on capital, but also harmonizing, for example, our VAT system. We now have uh, three VAT uh, levels. The 21% is a normal one. And then we have the 12% and the 6% gives a lot of problems with compliance. Uh, for example, if you go in Belgium to the McDonald's or another uh, fa fast food store, you will also always ask you, uh, are you going to eat it here or are you going to eat it uh, somewhere else? And it depends 
on where you're going to eat it, what the VAT uh, level is. So, 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 so that's the way and, and that's how difficult our system is today. So that is also one of the reasons where, uh, why we are also doing some reforms in that, in that way. And there are greater chances of success. <laughs> and then, of course, that's a, the, the second question. Um, well, of course, today we, we uh, are discussing this uh, proposal that is currently on the table uh, in, the, in the government. Of course, and we are, we are a complex coalition. We are seven parties in the coalition, from the, the Liberals, the, the Greens, Socialists, and the, the Christian Democrats, from myself. Yeah, that, that's, that's quite difficult, because you have, of course, all different views. And, and what I always like to avoid is that, that there are vetoes, uh, because if, if, if every party can put its veto in the, in the discussion, that means that in the end, no one will get anything extra because that is of course the goal the people that work will have at the end net uh, more on their on their bank accounts well if you're all putting a veto on the table and, and of course yeah uh, balancing and, and, and balancing out all the all the different proposals that are on the table at the end nobody no citizen no p person that work will get uh, a euro extra at the end of the month on his uh, on his bank account and then we talked a bit of the revenue side of the budget. On the expenditure side, the Belgian government is also trying to undertake for many months now a pension reform. I know you're not fully in charge of that, but um, it impacts you in that it is one of the conditions required by Belgium to unlock the first tranche of RF funding. Mm -hmm. Belgium is one of the countries that still has not yet presented. You've received the 13% prepayment, but you haven't yet received anything else from the recovery funds because of this blockage. So where are things at now? And you know, the 2026 deadline to spend recovery funds is fast approaching. Is there a worry that it won't be enough? Well, that's of course the, the, the difficulty in the uh, plan that we're going to propose with the milestones. We have 22 milestones. It's only one of them that is not met and that's of course the pension reform, which is an important one to get the 875 uh, million, uh, million euros. Um, I, I really believe that, um, of course, the, the amount of money that we'll get from the, from the RRF is important um, to do some, some reforms. It's a stick today to actually um, ask us, force us to, to do that reform. But in the same way, if you look to the, 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 the evolution of our deficit, I think that we are just, it's, there is really a need for a sense of urgency. And it's really necessary that we do this kind of reforms, that we are able to find a ways if people uh, go on retirement too early or earlier than expected, well, we need to convince them to work longer and, and to find ways how we are actually are going to, uh, to, to, meet that, uh, to meet that requirement. But the, the, the way how the... Uh, RRF and the next generation EU and, and, and the way how they are going to deal with the, the well, where, where they put the, the reforms as a milestone, I actually see that that way of working also a little bit in the, the, the new economic governance rules and, and, and review that is actually on the table, where they also ask us and where you, they g give us the possibility to prolong our time window from four to seven years by actually proposing structural reforms. Well, I think that a country like Belgium is actually need that uh, because that, that's actually a little bit of stick uh, that, that will help us to, 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 to do these reforms because that will also help us to in the medium term bring that, that deficit and also definitely that, uh, that level to a more sustainable uh, level. Thank you so much. I think that's all we have time for right now. But thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, I welcome <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, we're now moving to a panel discussion. Can I please welcome to the stage my most distinguished guest, uh, Margarina Marques, member of European Parliament with the Portuguese Socialist Party and author of the Parliament's report on reforming the Stability and Growth Pact. Lucio Penck, who is currently Senior and Resident Fellow at Bruegel, but until a few months ago, he was the Director of Macroeconomic Policy on the Commission's Economic and Fiscal Policy, and as such, the intellectual dad of this reform. <laughs> Um, I'm a little lost here. Philippe Martin, who is, of course, Dean of uh, Sciences Po Economic and uh, Political School. Please give them a round of applause. Um, 
I wanted to start by setting a bit the scene, if that's okay with you. Um, the question that we launched this debate around is, is fiscal policy out of control and how to rein it back in? So, Philip, let me start with you and then Lucio and then I'll go to Margarita. Um, so, so it's true that after the, the, the COVID years, uh, the debt has increased uh, tremendously and, uh, and we, uh, we put the, the fiscal rules on, on the sign. So it's clear that we need to, uh, to change track and, and uh, go back to, uh, to, to make sure that we have debt sustainability. And in a sense, I think that uh, what's wrong with uh, our fiscal framework is exactly this, is that uh, we lost track of what, uh, is, uh, what was important and what was the objective of fiscal rules, uh, which is to ensure debt sustainability. Because in a sense, uh, uh, that's the real problem uh, uh, of the collateral damage that one country uh, can, uh, can, uh, can put on the others. And that's what we've seen during the, the euro crisis. And we've lost track of that. Uh, and today, again, and related to your question, the real question is to what extent uh, our debts are sustainable uh, which depend on many factors, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, which is not only the deficit or the debt level, but also the interest rate, the growth rate of the economy, the inflation, uh, which is completely absent from, uh, from uh, existing uh, fiscal rules. And so, uh, yes, we need to take back control of this, uh, this issue, but taking uh, into account the fact that uh, debt sustainability is the core of the, of the problem. And so from that point of view, I think that uh, uh, the proposals that have been made uh, go in the right direction. I'm sure we'll come back to more details, but that's the, that's the goal indeed, debt sustainability. And that means that requires a, a, a quite holistic approach, meaning not only these magic numbers that, uh, that we had, but really trying to understand uh, what makes the debt of a country sustainable and therefore uh, does not put at, into risk the, uh, the collateral damage that could be brought by a country uh, which, would, uh, which would lose debt sustainability because what we've seen during the euro crisis is that in this case other countries, and that's part of what economists would call an externality, would have to, uh, uh, to, to help to make transfers and or it would uh, put some pressure on the ECB to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to help uh, the country with the different programs uh, we've seen. Although I do believe that actually a big change compared to what we had before is that the ECB has also moved towards uh, a, a, a stance where uh, in some sense it is in charge of ruling out debt crises which are based on self-fulfilling expectations. And, and that's important because in a sense what that means is that the fiscal framework, taking back uh, you know, fiscal responsibility, means really looking at the fundamentals, uh, which again depend on interest rate, on uh, uh, growth rate, on uh, the, of course the, the, the budget balance. Uh, but in a sense what has been clarified and I think that's welcome is that the ECB should be in charge of taking out uh, those crises uh, which, for example, uh, Portugal suffered during the euro crisis, which are mostly based on self-fulfilling expectations and, and speculation. Thank you. Lucio, where did the idea come from to reform the fiscal rules? I mean, you've sat through more than one reform in your previous hat. Uh, well, uh, to begin with, as, uh, as it happens uh, in the institution, uh, uh, there was an institutional uh, deadline, so we were supposed to report mm, every five years on the reform, so clearly this gave uh, the um, opportunity uh, or even the necessity for us to review. On substance, we realized, and I should stress that the reflection went on uh, uh, started well before the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis, open a parenthesis, I mean, we should have delivered earlier, as you, as, as you may know, to discuss what was really necessary and what was not, mm, in a sense, uh, in the fiscal framework that we had in the light of the experience. Um, so the idea, if I can said very briefly in terms of high level principle and then we know that uh, there are many many details on which discussion are are, are, are taking place and we will it will continue as we had basically there are two high level principles 
One is the one of fiscal sustainability, the other is the one of national ownership. Fiscal sustainability for the reason that uh, uh, Philippe has argued, <laughs> indeed is the main, if not only, reason for having fiscal rule at the EU level on the top of fiscal, the fiscal rule that countries may wish or may wish not to have at national level. Namely, the externalities, the spillovers uh, that unsustainable fiscal policy, especially in the context of monetary union, may have on the rest of the currency area. So this is the reason for having fiscal rule, I mean, the economic reason. Well, national ownership, because we should, for, we should not forget uh, that uh, <laughs> member states remain fiscal sovereign. Uh, in spite also of the language of the treaty on the ban on excessive deficits, but in reality, without entering a complicated analysis, um, uh, uh, the EU does not have the power to, to interfere in budgetary policy, as it has in other policies, for example, with direct effect. In the end, it's the government that makes the budget. So the idea is how best reconcile these two elements, uh, where attention <laughs> I think, as yes, you can see, is, is, clearly, is clearly possible. I mean, uh, uh, countries uh, thinking of their own, uh, say, political, typically political domestic calculation may not take uh, on board enough the concern uh, uh, about sustainability. But beyond this preoccupation, so there is an element clearly of potential tension, uh, the idea was also of giving more freedom to countries that, after all, remain fiscal sovereign, I mean, to pursue a fiscal policy according to their, uh, to their preference. So this was the initial. So uh, just, I don't know, <laughs> just a minute more to, to, to develop on this. On the fiscal sustainability, clearly, you, you can get there in many ways. Hmm? So you can say, if you have a balanced budget uh, rule, this will be ensuring asymptotically convergence of debt to zero, and then you will not have problem of uh, fiscal backing, maybe the opposite in of, the, of the central bank. But clearly, this puts a lot of constraint also on the policies you can do. <coughs> so in the end, the thought, well, OK, why we don't address the problem directly? So instead of coming up with uh, some magic number or magic formula, uh, why we don't use the tool that with all the, its imperfection exists, namely debt sustainability analysis, I mean to assess mm, the trajectory of a country. Uh, just to me, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be specific in this respect, if you have a number, and I leave aside the 3%, which has a recognized value, more or less is a kind of coordination point, you do have a problem in the context in the confrontation with one country. So you should do this uh, because you are at 1.5% away from the MTO of close to balance or in surplus. But then if you ask me as economist, now I can speak a bit more freely because <laughs> I'm a former official. So why a balanced budget? Then the answer is, well, because it's a cool number. <laughs> you see, <laughs> you don't have really much of a... Uh, Whereas it's more difficult for a country, say, that finds itself in a very high debt position, say, yes, actually, we think it's a good idea to keep our debt increasing. So you bring the discussion with all this difficulty on more serious terrain hmm? uh, uh, by introducing the element of, directly the element of analysis of sustainability. The other point that in part contributed this was actually alluded to mm, by the minister in, in his interview was the experience of the recovery and resilience facility. Mm. So we saw that there is opportunity. I would not exaggerate that, uh, because in the case of the recovery and resilience facility, we know there is a big pot of money, <laughs> and that encourages a cooperative, uh, a cooperative <laughs> spirit. Here we are not there. Uh, but we saw the potential of having, say, a dialogue with member states in order to help achieve mm, a path which is owned, I mean, as it's fashionable to say, by the member state itself, while satisfying a number of requirements essentially linked uh, to sustainability. And this also linked with the issue of reform, uh, which are a condition for the extension of the adjustment period. 
uh, uh, according to the reform proposal. Thank you. Margarita, we come to you. I mean, you had asked the Commission to come up with a reform, um, quite a different one from what you had sorry, from what you had proposed, but can you give us a sense of how did you read it uh, and is it answering to the need for reform? Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you also to the Fundação Manuel Antonio dos Santos. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the political. Also, this is the good moment uh, to discuss, uh, the, to, discuss uh, to, to have this debate. Uh, it means, uh, uh, when I, I listened to the, the Vice Prime Minister, in my mind I had the idea, it's a pity that uh, he's member of the Belgian government and not member of the European Parliament, be because he could be a very good rapporteur from the EPP political family. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if uh, all the members of EPP are, are in your uh, line. Let me break a mini news. Uh, yesterday, I was told that uh, the parliament reached a deal on how to separate this file through the parliament, so it will be treated as a package, the three files combined, and the rapporteurship will be shared between SND and EPP. But sorry, carry on. <laughs> yes, of course, because uh, my, my, my reaction. So this is one point, and the second point is also uh, uh, linked to the, the, to the calendar, is, uh, and the minister already told, of course, we count on the Belgian presidents and the Spanish, because we'll see what will happen with the Spanish presidency, because I think that we need an agreement for October and maybe uh, an agreement council uh, parliament for April. So it means that it's up to you to, to have this agreement. And I need to say also that your document, uh, the, 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 the Dutch and the Spanish uh, Spanish document together, uh, it was uh, a base, we can say, for the, it was important for the preparation of the Commission uh, proposal. So with Spanish presidents, we will see. But answering to your point, first of all, um, uh, this proposal of the Commission now is different than the Commission had proposal in last November, and we will arrive on this point. But what is important, in my view, uh, and the, the proposal of the Commission is a good starting point, is because the uh, Commission accepted part of the main principles or the main principles adopted by the European Parliament. The case by case, uh, more transparency, more democratic accountability, simpler, more simple rules, because the complexity is too big nowadays, and uh, uh, more uh, ownership from member states. And this ownership, the minister already explained very well, but there are another argument because why ownership is needed. Because the countries, when we look to the respect of the country-specific recommendation, it's, it's not the best one. So it's, not, it's less than 30%. So it means that we need more ownership to convince the member states to respect the national plans. So this is positive, the fact that there are the case by case and the fact that each member state will put on the table his, uh, its uh, national plan for four or more years, it depends. Uh, it means uh, what the, the member states must do to achieve the, 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 the targets. The national plan must, can be revised if there are a, a, a changing in the government with elections, for example. This, for the democratic point of view, is very important because give to the, uh, how the democracy is functioning in the member states. So there are a new government with a new political program the new government can adapt the national plan is also, in my view, a very positive thing. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, uh, some uh, limitations. Uh, it's, it means, in my view, the main difficulty, and it's why, in our view, the rules are not, are not completed, is the fact that there are not a fiscal capacity. 
I need to say that I feel more and more that this expression, fiscal capacity, became or becomes a taboo. It means like a constitutional treaty, like federalism, uh, uh, becomes a, a, a taboo. But I think that we need an investment fund to support investment. This is, it's not, I'm not the first uh, saying this. I listened to from um, Chancellor Scholz uh, during his speech uh, in, uh, in uh, Prague University. So this investment capacity is needed in my view because it's clear the difference including the respect of the, 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 the compliance with the country-specific recommendation, how things are working now with Next Generation EU and before. There are a big difference. And, uh, uh, of course, we have this experience. It's why it's also positive the fact that the proposal of the Commission is inspired on the governance of uh, the uh, RRF uh, mechanism. Uh, and uh, this investment is needed, why? Is needed to support uh, public, uh, uh, public goods, uh, namely the four main uh, European priorities. It means uh, social pillar, uh, European social pillar, uh, defense, uh, climate transition, and uh, digital transition. By the way, it's uh, the, the Commission on the examination of the uh, national plans will have, will look uh, to the investments made on these four priorities. And it's not a golden rule, but is the treatment and the how the investment on these four areas uh, is uh, treated. So this is the specificity. Finally, I'd like to say that um, the power of the Commission, there are some criticisms saying that uh, the, the power of the Commission is too big. Uh, I don't support exactly this idea, but this must be uh, clarified. Uh, it means with the annexes that the Commission is now putting on the table, I think that the framework, uh, how the Commission will assess the national plans can control, in a way, the power of uh, uh, the Commission. So we have this proposal. Uh, this is not ambitious enough because there are not a fiscal capacity or an investment capacity. There are some safeguards, so it means that the reduction of uh, 0.5 on the deficit is a problem. It's, very, it's a good news that uh, Belgium can do it in the, 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 the calendar, but I think that some member states will have this problem. And there are also a difference comparing to the November proposal. It means the reduction of the debt uh, before uh, the end of the uh, national plan. So now, uh, the, the role of the parliament, uh, we uh, need to give uh, its co-decision, one of them. The first one is co-decision. Uh, the Parliament is committed uh, to have uh, an agreement and to work hard to find a compromise respecting the calendar because uh, new rules are needed uh, for the next year, for the next budgetary uh, period. Uh, so we need to have this compromise. But we have a problem. It means we have a problem. It means a difficulty for the adoption of the report. It means the elections in one year. Because until now, uh, every. Um, all the political groups, the main political groups, the first uh, goal, it was to find compromises for legisl to legislate. Since now, I think that the priority is more for each political group 
to have uh, clear repositions before, uh, because elections in uh, uh, one year. Only to end, I'd like only to react to uh, the, the point on the debt sustainability. Of course, I fully agree with you, we, uh, but we need to have more balance between debt sustainability and uh, 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 sustainable uh, investment. So we can't be in the same uh, problem that we had before, where economic growth it was almost zero on the last decades and the public investment very, very uh, uh, much. So we need to balance both sustainable debt, I agree, but to balance with uh, sustainable uh, investment. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to be a bit more strict in response time because I want to run through a number of topics with you. Um, but Lucio, let's come to um, some of the last minute additions to the proposal because let's remind for our audience, you had tabled an orientation, um, I think it was an orientation paper or whatever it was called, the but essentially your communication, setting out what the idea, what the architecture of the proposal was going to be like, then a few months elapsed. And at the last minute, after you left uh, DJ Ekfin, uh, some safeguards were added. And now I'm going to try to remember them all, but essentially a requirement to reduce the debt level within the time horizon of the plan, a requirement that this should happen in the period of the plan, so not backloading, not leaving this for the last few years, uh, a requirement uh, to comply with the 0.5% deficit reduction, even when a country is not into an excessive deficit procedure. I'm missing the fourth now. <laughs> I don't know if you can help me, but essentially these safeguards were presented and introduced in the proposal by the Commission um, at the request mainly of Germany, who felt that the, as um, the, the orientation paper was not strict enough, it did not give enough guardrails for that reduction. And so now that you don't have to speak with uh, your official censorship anymore, I would like to, to give us the <laughs> your assessment of the final proposal as it was presented. Well, there are some differences between uh, uh, the communication and the legislative proposal. As you said, I think these are the official document that we, are, that we have in front of us. Uh, in part, this uh, uh, reflects the simple fact that the communication uh, gives policy orientation and uh, uh, is uh, therefore drafted in a language that is different uh, uh, from that of a legislative proposal, which is a legal document. But in part, there are, as you pointed out, uh, some uh, more substantial differences and uh, that essentially relate to extra requirement mm, that are uh, set out uh, for the plans that should be assessed and eventually endorsed by the Council and after that becoming uh, a binding reference for uh, national budgetary policies in the medium term, which is an important dimension. I think the, the Minister was right to highlight that this a medium term dimension. Uh, now, we can only speculate, I mean, but you have done the speculation for me, why uh, this uh, element were added uh, 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 in relation to the uh, design in the communication. Uh, probably, uh, given the position that Member State ma made uh, clear uh, after the communication of the Commission, indeed, there was a certain uh, will to appease uh, concern uh, voiced by some countries, notably Germany, about the fact that uh, uh, the requirements were not stringent enough. Let me, let me blunt on this. I think I understand, uh, <laughs> having gone through it uh, for a long time, uh, the political mechanisms that brought about these changes. At the same time, uh, my concern is that uh, one risk of falling between two stools, in the sense that but again, here I'm speaking as a spectator. Apparently, Germany is not satisfied either. I mean, I don't know whether the situation is 26 versus 1, as you put it to the minister, who was more <laughs> diplomatic. But clearly, Germany is not appeased. <laughs> Whereas the changes that I've introduced 
put it bluntly, do not make so much economic sense. Uh, or in some cases uh, uh, are effectively redundant uh, to what was already in the original design. So at the very, le uh, at the very least, uh, we have a bit of a loss in terms of clarity of the proposal because as has been uh, as has been recalled one of the objective of the proposal was to simplify if there is one thing on which everybody agreed about the EU fiscal rule that they are too complicated then after that the different uh, uh, different uh, different views emerge now uh, i mean i could go into more detail but I mean, let me know, because I, <laughs> no, I, I know myself, if I get into this, <laughs> I could give you, <laughs> I, I could give a kind of lecture on each and every point. Uh, uh, let me stress two points, I mean, at this stage. One thing that is often forgotten, and which is, I think, a, a very important legal point, that what matters in the end suppose that the, 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 the reform come to pass, would be the adjustment path which is endorsed by the council. So yeah. this is what will matter. So to give you an example mm -hmm. from the excessive deficit procedure. In the excessive deficit procedure, which if you wish is the most binding of all the instruments we have, there are a number of requirements, for example, a 0 0.5 minimum adjustment uh, as a rule. Having said that, if you have a specific excessive deficit procedure and the council in its wisdom decides to tell a country, well, 0 0.5 is not necessary in this case or in this year you can do 0 0.3, then this is what is binding once you have the decision of the council and, what, uh, and for the purpose of the case, <coughs> what you read in the legislation becomes irrelevant once you have a decision. So this is one point. So in a sense, we should not get too much bogged down on some, uh, on some uh, 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 detail element, bearing in mind what will be agreed and this will be, uh, this will be binding. The other element, and this is a bit more speculative, or if you, want, or if you, want, or if you wish, as a matter of interpretation, is uh, uh, clearly these different requirements will have to be juggled together somewhere. I mean, there will be a job of interpretation and uh, an appropriate hierarchy will be necessary where I believe that the key criterion of sustainability, so bringing the debt uh, on a declining or a prudent or, or ensuring that it stays a prudent level, should, uh, uh, should uh, be prevailing. Let me give just an example on this. But huh? be short. Very short. Yes, very short. One of the criteria that you mentioned. Mm, that debt should be at the end of the adjustment period at the lower level than the yeah. beginning. I mean, now, in economic terms, this doesn't make much sense. Uh, uh, okay, but okay, I leave uh, uh, <laughs> Philippe, who is a professor of economics, to explain tax mooting and, <laughs> and all that jazz, as they say. But let me be concrete. Take Estonia, you know, the country which is one of the lowest debt of Estonia, Luxembourg, now I'm not sure I have the figure of the money. So around 20% of GDP. Are we serious that we are going to ask Estonia to present a, a program where debt must be lower? I mean, it may be that uh, Estonian plants are such that uh, given the rate of growth and the plant are after deficit, but if the Estonian have, a, for example, a program for a, a military build-up, just to give an example by chance, uh, clear it is, we would also deny the principle of sustainability because Estonia is uh, among the best of the class when it comes I mean, to sustainability risk. So the assessment would be, well, <laughs> the debt would be at prudent level. It seems almost, it seems, no, I wouldn't say self-evidence, clear to me that an element of interpretation would be needed I, in order to avoid otherwise, I mean, uh, patent uh, self-contradictory uh, uh, self conclusion. And I stop here. And maybe, um, as my reporting said, uh, the reason why Estonia is bagged in the same country as everyone is that France actually did not want to have 
the same label as Italy did not want to be considered a high debt country, so they requested the Commission to actually delete this distinction that it had originally proposed, high debt, medium debt, low debt, everybody's treated the same result, Estonia and France, very different debt levels, but same category. So, Philip, let me come to you. I wanted to spend the last few minutes, and now I'll be really strict, don't make me be mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> on what is the likely landing zone. And actually, we have talked about Germany, um, we have a member of uh, the Parliament, of the European Parliament, but from Portugal. But I would like to know a little bit more about what do you see as the debate being in France? What are French priorities, and what role is it playing? You know, because in Europe we know that if there is no agreement with France and Germany, nothing moves. So, well, it's true that France is in a particular situation because it's clearly, uh, let's be honest, a high debt country now, uh, and it's a high debt country. Uh, which, uh, you know, in, in terms of the dynamics of the debt, uh, we've seen the, 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 the stability uh, program uh, uh, sent uh, uh, a, few, a few weeks ago. It's really on a knife edge situation, huh, in the sense that uh, it's super ambitious in terms of uh, reducing its uh, government expenditures at a growth rate of 0.6% per year. Uh, in the next uh, five years, which has never been done in France for the last 20 years. So I think that one problem for France uh, is that uh, France lacks credibility on, uh, on, on its uh, fiscal path. Uh, and, and, and this, I think, weakens the, the French position uh, in, uh, in Europe. I mean, a clear problem, and in some sense, this is one of the, the German concerns which we have to take seriously, is the lack of trust. Uh, and the lack of trust towards, in particular, one country, which is, uh, which is France. And I'm not going to talk about the others, but I think th there's the same lack of, uh, of, of trust. And it's true that from that point of view, um, uh, when we see what, was, what has happened, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're lowering taxes in France, uh, even more so, so it's not <laughs> conducive to, to debt sustainability from, uh, from this point of view. We're doing a bit better in terms of growth than maybe what was expected, uh, but at the same time, we're not reducing uh, uh, fast enough, I think, all the expenditures which are related to the energy crisis. So from that point of view, I think France is not in a great position to, uh, to, uh, to, to put its uh, position uh, in, uh, I mean, to it's, uh, it's a political position and political arguments. Uh, at the same time, you have to see that in France itself, uh, the, fr the, the French position is, uh, you know, is not unanimous. Um, in, in some sense, the uh, lack of clarity, the complexity of the rules, and Lucia was saying, I think we can land towards a situation where, yes, maybe we've made some progress towards some clarification, but the compromise will be such that, you know, with all these little things which have been uh, added, you know, it's not going to be completely consistent, I'm afraid. Uh, but in a sense, I would say that in some parts of the government, you know, this lack of uh, clarity, this uh, uh, absence of simplification is, is in some sense welcome because France <laughs> for a long time has been able to circumvent uh, 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 fiscal rules uh, by using uh, this, uh, this complexity. Um, so um, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, as you as you understand, I'm not <laughs> I'm not representing uh, the, the the French government, but I I do think that we'd better. I mean, the, the 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 I think the main objective for the French government today should be to increase growth. From that point of view, I think it's not doing so badly, but in terms of its uh, fiscal plan, I think we we lack uh, we lack credibility, and in particular on 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 um, on government expenditures. Uh, uh, so, so we're really on a knife edge. I mean, the ambition of the the, the, the pact is, uh, is, I mean, that that um, the, um, the, uh, the the of what we sent to Brussels is basically stabilizing the debt. Huh? It's mm -hmm. not super ambitious, and at the same time, uh, we are. It's uh, it's based on uh, an assumption that uh, the growth rate of expenditure is going to be super low, uh, and and so I'm I'm a bit afraid about this uh, the the. Um, the, the credibility of the, the, French, uh, the French position. At the same time, I'm, I'm all in favor, uh, I've said that before, of, uh, of having more flexibility at the country level, having more 
uh, ownership at the, at, the, uh, at the national level. One thing I would criticize, and I will end with that, is that I, I think that the Commission position does not give enough uh, power to the national independent uh, fiscal institution. So it's not going in the direction of giving more ownership at the national level, which, you know, in France and in many other countries is a good excuse. You know, it's the fault of Brussels if we're not doing the right thing. Uh, no, we should have a, a, a I mean, uh, of course, debt sustainability is important for other European countries, but it's also important mostly for, for yourself. And, and so that, I think, is a criticism I would put on the Commission, uh, the commission proposal. Thank you. Just a technical plea to please remain seated because we are recording the event and I was reminded to ask our audience to remain seated. Um, I wanted to have one more question in a very busy round uh, on what is missing um, in the text or what will be left to interpretation. And here I'm referring to the investment and reforms, which the minister earlier said will be part of the assessment on debt sustainability. There was uh, a push politically from a number of countries to include defense as one of the eligible expenditures under this extension of the timeline. Uh, there is obviously also climate and digitalization, which remain EU priorities. Uh, literally 30 seconds, starting from Philippe Margarida and then Lucio. Um, can you tell me, you know, how do you see this, positively or critically? Um, I feel it uh, positively. It means the, the, the capacity of the member states to do uh, investments. Uh, and it's not par hasard <laughs> uh, that the Commission decided to include the four pillars where there are, uh, I don't want to use the word, but I don't uh, find a better word, tolerance concerning these four uh, investments. And I think that the main goals of this revision is to conciliate, as I said before, the sustainability of the debt with the investment. Because it's clear that since 2010, we made some progress, creating the next generation EU, for example, having an European answer, and this was very positive to react to COVID, to relaunch the European economy, the national economies, but we need to use this learning for the future. And it's why uh, we feel that uh, we need to give to member states the capacity to invest. And we need to look with the figures today. Of course, we spoke on the situation uh, in France, but average at EU level is 90%. So, uh, more than 90%. So, I think that we, we, we can't be blind and to look to these figures as this was not uh, a problem. And finally, I think that what is needed now is to have, to, to have credible rules for now and for the future, to give pre previsibility, because the, po the problem with the Maastricht rules, it was some modifications later on and so on, but it was clear, including before COVID, that the rules was not, were not adopted, uh, adapted, and it's why after COVID the general escape clause was activated. We need rules for now, for a regular situation and for crisis, to have the capacity and to maintain the credibility uh, of the rules. Thank you. Philippe, your final thoughts. Uh, so, climate. Um, I, I hear the arguments of you know, excluding climate investment from the debt sustainability. I think it's not right. I don't think it's right because we need to finance these. Uh, I mean, if we finance these uh, investments through debt, this debt has to be sustainable. So it's not as if they disappear from the financing problem. However, um, I think that uh, the, the right track would be either to analyze debt sustainability and the, the timeline of the necessary public investment in, uh, for climate into the, the, the analysis, what I was calling for holistic uh, uh, analysis of debt sustainability. And then a third track, which I think is the, uh, also a very good one, is uh, the, the fiscal capacity at, uh, at the European level. Uh, this is typically an investment that has spillovers. Uh, clearly, uh, climate is not a national issue. It's not even a European issue. But clearly, that, that would be uh, my, uh, my, uh, my best solution, is to go through a fiscal capacity to finance more uh, climate investments. Thank you. And then the final question for Lucio. 
why is there no fiscal capacity in the proposal? And also, if there was one, how should it be designed? Well, why there is no fiscal capacity? I think, uh, I mean, the, the Commission, I mean, people in the Commission have more authority than I have, have been rather clear on a number of occasions. It's already a very contentious file, as we have heard. So adding to it the fiscal capacity would be <laughs> ensure that we would go nowhere because we know how controversial the issue is. On the top of the fact that, as has been recalled, at the moment, I mean, the, the RRF is being deployed. So at the very least, one could say, let's see the result that the RRF, which is, if you wish, a fiscal capacity, sui generis uh, uh, yields uh, before we can uh, take stock of that, uh, before we can, we can decide. Now, how should it be? So, not for now, for the future. Let me say, there has been a bit of a change in the debate. Uh, uh, until not long ago, the focus on fiscal capacity was on a stabilization capacity. So there were a lot of plans made, well, including by economists, the Commission, elsewhere, bearing in mind, well, the, the, there is a single monetary policy, there is a problem of stabilization, so you need... More recently, I think uh, the idea has evolved, and perhaps there the RRF has been instrumental in this shift, uh, in having a new fiscal capacity aimed at the provision of public good. And there are two different things. We're clearly public good as a more medium, long-term perspective. I mean, it's not, you, don't, you may have cyclical stabilization, <laughs> you may not have, depending on the phase of the cycle in which you deploy this expenditure. Team seems to be possibly politically more promising if we agree that uh, 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 climate change is the biggest challenge is perhaps the one that it makes more sense in order to reconcile the point, uh, I mean, the tension uh, 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 mentioned by Philippe between ensuring sustainability of that at national level mm, and uh, delivering the necessary investment uh, within a certain time frame, more, moreover, to avoid the worst outcome in terms of climate change. So this seems to me, but uh, this is a, a bit of an, an opinion, I mean, not uh, clearly a, an official position, possibly the most, uh, uh, the most promising way forward, but not for now for the reason that I try to explain. Thank you all very much. I'm afraid that we're already a little bit over time. So I would like to thank our panelists for a fascinating discussion and please give us a round of applause. <laughs> I, will I haven't picked questions from Slido because I could only read three and I think that they were addressed by the panelists. So uh, forgive me if you haven't heard your, uh, your question read, but I hope that you found your answer. Um, I just wanted to quickly read the results of the poll that we asked you earlier. So the question was, should the EU change its fiscal policy paradigm? 49% of you answered that yes, by focusing on economic stability as its main objective. 43% uh, answer yes, but by focusing on mainly on promoting its competitiveness. And 8% said no, the current paradigm should be maintained with minor adjustments without redirecting priorities. So thank you all of all. Thanks our speaker for joining, for, so speakers for joining us and to the audience for watching here and online. Um, and thank you for the Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos for making this event possible. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please reach out to me or to my colleagues and uh, feel free to email us about the event at live at politico.eu. Finally, you can check all of our Politico events um, for the website is www.politico.eu slash events. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Mm -hmm.